Good evening. I'm Terry Rhodes, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I would like to welcome you to tonight's Abbey Speaker Series event, Democracy and Social Media, Helping or Hurting. The Abbey Speaker Series is hosted by UNC's Program for Public Discourse, which seeks to build our students' capacities for debate and deliberation and to foster a culture of constructive dialogue at UNC and beyond. Four times each year, the Abbey Speaker Series brings together experts from different fields and disciplines to showcase productive dialogue on timely issues across a range of perspectives. This year's Abbey Speaker Series will focus on the relationship between democracy and public discourse. Tonight's event explores how social media has changed the way citizens and politicians communicate with each other. Especially after the Arab Spring that began a decade ago, social media platforms were hailed as a means of democratizing information and holding leaders accountable. More recently, however, social media has been depicted as a threat to democracy due to the ways in which online platforms appear to fuel polarization, to regulate speech, and to accelerate the spread of disinformation and conspiracy theories. Tonight's panel brings together experts from different fields, media studies, political science, and artificial intelligence, who are passionate about preserving democracy and ensuring that social media remain compatible with democratic values. I'm sure it will be a lively discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists and moderator. Rahman Chowdhury describes herself as operating at the intersection of humanity and technology. She is now the director of Twitter's META program. META stands for Machine Learning Ethics, Transparency and Accountability. Dr. Chowdhury joined Twitter after founding and serving as CEO of Parity AI, a platform that helps corporations analyze their artificial intelligence models to address issues of bias, transparency and privacy. Dr. Chowdhury has a master's degree in quantitative methods of the social sciences from Columbia University and a doctorate in political science from the University of California, San Diego. Siva Vidyanathan is the Robertson Professor of Media Studies and Director of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. He worked as a journalist for five years before earning a PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. He is also a columnist at The Guardian and Slate. His most recent book is Antisocial Media, How Facebook Disconnects Us and Undermines Democracy. It provides a comprehensive account of the effects Facebook has had on the world. And our moderator is Yasha Monk, an associate professor of the practice at Johns Hopkins University, where he holds a joint appointment in the School of Advanced International Studies and the Agora Institute. His work concerns the rise of populism and the crises facing liberal democracy. And he is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Professor Monk is a contributing writer at The Atlantic and founder of the online publication, Persuasion. His most recent book, The People Versus Democracy, argues that the core components of liberal democracy individual rights and the popular will are at war with each other. He has a PhD in political science from Harvard University. Thank you to all of our panelists for participating in what is sure to be a lively and thoughtful discussion. And now I'll turn it over to Yasha, our moderator. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this warm welcome and I'm really excited uh, for the panel that we have uh, ahead. Um, just two notes for the audience. First of all, a recording of this conversation is going to be available at the PPD YouTube channel. And secondly, I really look forward to hearing uh, the questions of our many attendees. So please feel free now or at any point during the conversation uh, to put your question into the, the chat function, the Q&A function, I should say. Um, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, so it's a great topic for today's conversation, uh, social media and democracy helping or hurting. 
Um, so, Roman, um, what do you think about this? Is social media a threat to democracy? Should we be worrying that Twitter and Facebook are going to destroy democracy? Um, short answer, no. Uh, longer answer, I think, you know, the availability of open public discourse and reducing the barriers to having your voice being heard is always a double-edged sword and is a complicated, compli complicated things to discuss. And it is wonderful that a lot of people have access to be able to reach individuals and talk to others in a way that has literally been unprecedented prior to, frankly, the internet. Uh, that being said, it enables a lot of people who are actively malicious or maybe even just misguided to have equal access to that platform. And that sort of openness, I would say, is sometimes the ugliness of a purely democratic institution, um, but also something worth serving and cultivating. Uh, Siva, what do you think about this? I mean, I'm really yeah. struck by the fact that we used to have this really positive view of social media 10 or so years ago. I used to teach a class called Democracy in the Digital Age in which I saw my role as the professor to make the case for why social media might be really bad for democracy because that was going against the grain of what all my students believed at the time. Right. Um, and, and now we're in this weird situation where the conventional wisdom is that, that, that actually, uh, you know, it's the opposite of what we used to think, that, 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 that social media really is this existential threat to, to democracy. But perhaps make, make the case for that yeah. for us a little bit. Why, why, why is that a reasonable thing to think? Well, okay, so I like to disaggregate the question of social media. After all, media is a plural noun, right? So social media are rather than social media is. And that leads us to also distinguish among these various platforms because they are very different. They do different things for us and they work differently in the world. So let me just give some numbers to this to give you a sense of it. Twitter has about 330 million users, which sounds like a big number, but apologies to Roman who works for Twitter. That's not that big. It's not that big compared to say YouTube, which has 2 billion users. But here's the thing, YouTube and Twitter do different things in the world. We use them for different reasons. They're actually not very comparable. They compete for our attention and they compete for advertising money, but they're also connected, right? Content flows back and forth between them. So that's just two comparisons. Again, 330 million versus 2 billion. That's nothing compared to Facebook. Facebook by January 1st should reach 3 billion regular users in the world. There are 7.6 billion humans on earth and 3 billion of them will be Facebook users. Now, what are the top five social media platforms in the world? Well, it goes, it goes Facebook at 3 billion. It goes YouTube at about 2.1 billion, right? And then it's, it's uh, um, uh, WhatsApp at about 1.6 billion, Instagram at about 1.5 billion, Facebook Messenger at about 1.2 billion. So four, four of the top five are Facebook products, right? But let's also remember that even within that list, they all do different things for us. So many people are, and I would say most people who use Facebook, or most people who use WhatsApp are also Facebook users. Most people use Instagram are also Facebook users. Many people who use WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook all at the same time or, or on the phone at the, at the same time. Like, there is no exclusivity here, but the important thing is Facebook is an unprecedented example of a powerful global company with 300, I'm sorry, with 3 billion people constantly communicating and uploading things in more than 110 languages. We have never seen anything like this in the world. The question of its macro effects are just starting to be understood. The question of its micro effects are also just starting to be understood. We've had more than a decade to study it. Those of us who are in this field have been cataloging the negative externalities for some time, also cataloging the positive externalities for some time. And if there's a general conclusion to be reached about Facebook, it's really good for almost every one of those 3 billion people. That's why people are on it. That's why I'm on it, right? For the baby pictures and the puppy pictures and the, my cousin's wedding, cousin's kid's wedding, right? That's why we're there. We all get value out of it. We're not fools. While Facebook is good for individuals, it's it's tragic. It's, it's chronically bad for us collectively. 
this is not that much of a paradox. My car is great for me. Your car is probably great for you. Our cars collectively are terrible for us. What does that mean about democracy? Well, consider that the prevalence, this global reach of Facebook has had effects that are often not cataloged. We pay way too much attention to the particular content that flies across these platforms, especially the particular content that flies across Facebook. While that's important, especially in the local sense, that's often paying attention to the weather instead of the climate. Consider this though, when Facebook is so pervasive, it sucks up money from advertising of it, through advertising that would otherwise go to other outlets that might facilitate information in a more responsible way that might foster deliberation in a more responsible way. So Facebook in many ways is starving newspapers and magazines around the world. That's a problem. In addition, every other outlet has to pander to Facebook because if you don't find your content flowing across Facebook, you don't find an audience. So Facebook has restructured our media ecosystem from top to bottom. Whether it has a direct effect on democracy at this point, I think is indisputable. The nature of that effect actually differs country to country. We've seen authoritarian leaders and authoritarian movements deploy Facebook, hijack the power of Facebook really effectively to, uh, to gather their potential supporters, to find new supporters and bring them into the movement, to, to motivate them, to encourage them, to pour them to the polls, but often more disturbingly, to pour them into uh, organized efforts of harassment against opponents, critics, scholars, journalists, et cetera. We see this time and time again. So I have to say the US got off lucky on all of these things. So, so I think that there is a lot here and we were hoping to disentangle, but I feel like you've put a lot on the table, which is really helpful. I mean, you know, one thing that I always wonder about is sort of, there's one conversation about what would the world look like without social media, mm -hmm. right? If we were just, you know, we had today's level of development and all the other things going on today, but we just hadn't invented this strange technology that is now so omnipresent in, in our lives, right? That's one kind of conversation. That's a very interesting conversation from a perspective of social science and we're all social scientists here, right? Um, but it's sort of less immediately relevant because social media is going to be around. Then there's a different kind of question, which is, well, you know, what if a particular social media channel wasn't available? What if the outage we had of Facebook, as well as a few other things a couple of days ago, were permanent and Facebook just disappeared? Would that change anything, right? And then there's a third kind of question is, what, what if the most altruistic public-minded person was running Facebook and they were changing the algorithms in the optimal way to try and bring peace and democracy to the world, right? Okay. And those three questions are actually yeah. quite quite different. So, you know, Roman, perhaps let's, let's start with the smallest one of them, which is to say, you know, how much actually really depends on the particular platforms and the particular design of the algorithms? Um, does that really matter? Does that really influence how the world is? Or are we just tempted to say, hey, all these bad things are happening on Facebook, so it must be the fault of Facebook, but perhaps actually what's happening is just that a lot of people want to post stuff that, that we don't like. And whatever algorithm Facebook runs, that's still going to be the case. Yeah, so I, I think the common thread actually across all of your questions is this idea of monopolistic power and sort of scale of ownership and, you know, whether these industries sort of naturally trend towards monopolies and whether then if we're going to start talking about regulation, whether a regulation is actually more about breaking something up and, you know, enabling more, you know, different environments to be there. So the interesting thing about social media, just even as a, an, a, a, as a construct or as an industry is social media is only useful if there are lots of other people like me on it, right? Nobody wants to go into a social media platform with three people on it. We want lots of people. So like to an extent, like the idea of social media lends itself towards monopoly, question mark, maybe. Um, so I think that's kind of the interesting thing worth discussing is, you know, so we do create, you know, let's say, quote unquote, a marketplace of ideas, but then we throw on top of it algorithms, and then that's what starts to complicate things. So, you know, again, you know, complicated question, because on one end, personalization, to some extent, is a very good thing, right? Like, 
you want to see the things you like reading. You want to, you know, uh, follow and, and read the interesting things that the people who you like to hear from are posting. Given that these platforms are global, reverse chronological order would mean that if I live in California, it's going to be really hard for me to hear what my friends in Europe are talking about. And frankly, a lot of the people I follow, uh, because I'm in the guild of responsible AI, a lot of my favorite people to follow and learn from are in European time zones, which is sort of a structural thing, right? So A, to your point, like, Design really does matter. And what does it mean to design from the bottom up? Um, many ways to unpack that. One is like literally the design, like visually, what does it look like? You know, and even if you remember like the whole discussion about Facebook having um, response icons versus just like thumbs up, thumbs down, right? And the you know, same conversation exists on Twitter. Why are we only allowed to like? Why can't I dislike? Why can't I do crying face, right? And an active decision to not introduce like negative emojis means something. Um, so th there are design, but then there's like core fundamental algorithmic decisions, like what kinds of models you're using, what kind of data you are using, what are you imputing from that data? And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, for me is very fascinating. Uh, and just to, you know, boil it down to its basic characteristics, a model is exactly that. It is a representation of the world. It is an imperfect representation of the world, the same way a model airplane or a model car is something that is a decent representation of those things, but is not that thing. So any model of the world is a model. Uh, and we'll always have imperfection. And it's really like when we're thinking about a lot of these, you know, unethical, uh, you know, use cases or negative externalities or even things like misinformation, polarization, right? Uh, it is a function of things like optimization functions and limitations of what we're capable of doing with this model, balanced with, you know, what kind of data are we are, are we sharing and what kind of data is being picked up by these companies? Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that. Uh, I mean, Roman has given us a really good um, basic summary of the complications of this question. Algorithms are not algorithms are not algorithms, right? There are specific design choices made as people in companies design these algorithms and they, they're expressing certain values. They're embedding those values in their algorithms. Now, it just so happens that at Facebook, the two the primary values are growth in terms of total number of people using Facebook and engagement, which is not just a function of the amount of time people spend on Facebook, but the extent to which they click, share, like, and comment on posts on Facebook. And then the algorithms are specifically designed, and they've been very clear about this, to amplify those items that generate engagement, clicks, shares, likes, and comments. And therefore, unsurprisingly, the items that get amplified are those that generate strong emotions, spark strong emotions. Well, there are consequences of that. And we've seen them and you can look again at the at the weather instead of the climate and look at the, the anti-vaccine propaganda and the conspiracy theories and QAnon uh, and other things that are maladies in the world. Or you can look at the puppies and the babies, the good stuff, right? And all that gets amplified for the same reason because it's joy versus fear and hatred, right? All these strong human emotions. What's missing is a sense of the broccoli, right? The stuff we need as citizens in a democratic republic to learn and discuss and debate and deliberate about our future. And that's what's getting sucked out of our public systems, our, our public sphere. And, and instead we're being overrun by algorithmic choice, right? By design choice, as, as Roman has explained, overrun by feelings. Now there are, that's appropriate for many contexts. And Algorithmic personalization is great for shopping. It's not great for learning and it's terrible for politics. I, I love the idea of digging into this concept of broccoli because to Yasha, to your point of like, what is a world without Facebook? Like everybody on this call grew up in a world without Facebook, right? right like, yeah. This isn't we, like, we oh have no, that this is this, yeah. right, we, we have that. Like, and what's very fascinating <laughs> about being the generation that we are in is we were actually like semi-functioning pseudo proto adults or actual adults <laughs> in the pre Facebook world or pre social media world. And we have, you know, continue to be adults in that post world. So we're sort of this, you know, since we are all social scientists here, a really great, you know, natural experiment <laughs> of the pre and post design of, of like regression discontinuity design of what that might look like. And, you know, was it significantly better? I don't know. Um, I listened to this really great podcast that sort of talks through, uh, it's called You're Wrong About 
because I, you know, if I'm going to talk about it, I have to give them a plug. And it's really interesting because it, it like digs into the things that we vaguely remember from when we were younger and it sort of talks to what the real story was. And it's really fascinating to think through how much of what we understood as the world used to get filtered through, you know, like media giants, right? Uh, you know, a talking head, et cetera. So, you know, I, I don't, I, th there is an aspect here that we need to untangle, which is how much of this is, you know, problems with how media is distributed, how we talk about media, et cetera. This is not to say that social media companies are off the hook at all, because, you know, we do make design decisions. We do make, you know, active choices in what we choose to prioritize, what, what's important. But I do want to dig into this concept of broccoli, right? So since we all have studied American politics or some sort of politics, right? Uh, it is impossible to get people to educate themselves to go to the polls and make an informed decision. That has like always been a problem. You know, what do you do? Like the state of California, which I used to love, would mail you this little booklet. And I, I'm like, how does anybody vote at a poll? How do you go and you like, you know, remember, like I, I, I've always done absentee ballots because I literally sit there with like Wikipedia and eight pages open, researching everything. But that's me because I'm a big nerd. And in my opinion, the level of information that I will need to have to make an informed vote is significant. Yet that's broccoli consumption, right? Like I just happen to like that. I happen to like broccoli. So, you know, there is this concept here of like, and maybe it's worth talking about, like how might these platforms be utilized to make broccoli more palatable by somehow pouring cheese over it? I mean, I'm not optimistic about any of these companies having such an incentive. Like what's the payoff to them, right? These are companies. In addition, if we talk about Facebook specifically, it has particular ideological frames through which it has built itself. And Mark Zuckerberg has been very clear about his own ideological frames, right? But, but the question of where do we enjoy broccoli? How might we enjoy broccoli, right? The, the, the nutritious stuff, the stuff we actually need to be responsible citizens in a democratic republic. Of course, that's always been hard. That's always been a, a, a challenge and a problem. It's harder now for two reasons. One, our media ecosystems have squeezed out much of the broccoli, right? And like left very little opportunity for the solid, deep analysis mm -hmm. that we depend on to actually be visible at a high level. In addition, we have disinvested from the very institutions that foster deliberation and foster deep knowledge and and therefore allow for sort of proxy trust you know institutions of science institutions of learning our our national academies our uh, our international um, scholarly organizations and serious professional journalism all of which has been recoiled right and and retracted systematically across the world but especially in the united states or most acutely in the united states over 40 years that's a 40-year problem so both of these things happen at the same time right and what we have now are we have really strong instruments of motivation we have mm -hmm. the strongest instruments of motivation we ever had facebook is the best motivational tool ever invented if you want to find like-minded people and gather them to reinforce each other's egos and then commit them to filling a square or the national mall or invading the Capitol on the, on the, on the 6th of, of January, it's never been easier. But to deliberate deeply about matters of public importance, especially among differently minded people, that's getting to be almost impossible. And it's because we don't have the forums, the muscles or the reward system for allowing mm -hmm. that to happen. Yeah, I mean, there's a really interesting like algorithmic component to what you're talking about. So when you were sort of listing all the things that like one can mobilize people to do on social media, I was jokingly going to say Naruto run through Area 51. Uh, if you <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> if you remember that, right? Like I, I completely agree. It's very fascinating. So it's you know like how might we create you know healthy conversation, healthy debate, and healthy discussion? Um, and it's something I'm actually thinking a lot about in, you know, within my team at Twitter, you know, we've been talking about sort of capturing positive externalities, but this doesn't mean sort of, uh, you know, sort of ethics washing or like rose colored glasses and looking away from the problem. It's, you know, one issue with a lot of these discussions is, you know, as you may put it slightly philosophically, health is more than the absence of disease, right? Like, so when we often, when we're having these discussions about misinformation, ethical use, et cetera, we're very focused on like, how do we stop the bad stuff? And we should absolutely stop the bad stuff. The bad stuff needs to be stopped. However, 
what is that world in which we're doing exactly what you said, where people are having reasonable conversations and discussions and positive discourse that's not about like, you know, getting a zing or a gotcha or ending with like a sassy meme, right? And because like, and yes, like agree. So like to kind of spill a little bit of a, a dirty secret, I avoided Twitter until 2015, like 2016. Uh, and I, I actually, I was teaching data science at the time and, and I, I actually asked one of my students, I'm like, what's the point of being on Twitter? How am I supposed to express a complex thought in so few characters. And I worry that it just like, I, I actually think it led to like think speak, like you can only say certain things in certain ways and like optimize to be like, ah, zing. Uh, and at that time, you know, I preferred Facebook as my platform of choice because you could actually write your thoughts, you know, in a significant manner and people could give long form answers. So very funny, like how much the world has shifted, but also like, I agree, cause that was my perspective. Like, how do you on a social media platform uh, have this discourse. But I do want to point, like when you were listing social media companies, it was very interesting how you named ones that are more like messaging apps, like WhatsApp. And we didn't really get to talk about like the nature of the media you are sharing Absolutely. and how that impacts, you know, like the outcome of how people perceive it, what people take away from it. And also literally like uh, the ability to share misinformation or falsehoods or, you know, or, or even like to the point of the this talk, like, you know, impede or um, you know help, you know, the principles of democracy. And I find it really fascinating that you brought WhatsApp, and I I know exactly why. But then it's like, all right, should we expand to include Signal, Telegram, you know, SMS on my iPhone and Android, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, that's and this is the category problem I I, I pointed to, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook is unlike all of the others, even those that Facebook owns. Instagram is unlike all of the others. WhatsApp is like Telegram, right? There are a bunch of messaging service, Facebook Messenger in that whole list. I was citing the list uh, and I follow that list quite a bit, mostly to show the scale of Facebook relative to everything else, right? That 3 billion is a number no one has ever seen. The BBC has never reached 3 billion people. CNN has never reached 3 billion people. The Wall Street Journal has never, right? It's just this unbelievable thing uh, how there are you know twice as many Facebook users as there are Muslims in the world, right? That's that's a stunning number, and I think it's that it's that scale. I think a lot of people miss, especially when they try to imagine tweaks to Facebook that are supposed to solve the problem, right? When oh yeah, how are you going to scale that to three billion people in 110 languages? Go on, tell me, right? So that was really right. my point. But but your point on this is really valuable here. There is no other. Every service here does something different for us and they all work together in our information ecosystem which is why it was important to remember that instagram users don't stop using messaging services outside of instagram and and facebook users also use twitter right so uh while there's a relative number around the world and you can relatively look at the power of these companies they they aren't exclusive and content moves back and forth. We need to approach these questions from the point of view mm -hmm. of an ecosystem. And that makes it very hard for, forgive me, Ramon, quantitative political scientists, it because does. they're so used to isolating variables. And these are variables that cannot be isolated. Once they're isolated, they lose their meaning completely and you well, get I, a null I wanna, result. I, I wanna ask a question, which is, you know, even harder to isolate, but, but, but yeah. it's, it's an important naive question, I think, which is that I'm still not sure from this conversation, but I understand what impact social media has, right? So I think we've talked a lot about scale, which is also, you know, in part a problem of, of potential monopoly, or it's a problem of political power for companies, it's a problem of how they can use all of that to avoid taxes and other things. And, and I take that seriously, but let's leave that to one side of a moment and think right. about the discursive problem, right? The, the way in which social media transforms our public discourse in ways that might amplify falsehoods or that might make it easy for hateful politicians to rise and so on and so forth. And, you know, I still am not sure how different the world would look today hmm. if we didn't have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and, and all of the above. And I'm very aware that when you go back through history, you have people blaming the newest medium that's available for all of the problems of the time. So uh, the rise of Adolf Hitler was supposed, supposed to do with you know, radio and the ready availability of that. And many of the political problems of a post-war period were television, which was such a superficial mm -hmm. medium, right? And then when I was growing up, the sort of you know, cable television, and there's so mm -hmm. much a different entertainment and we're having a fracturing of a public sphere because not everybody's watching the same shows anymore. Um, well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe they and, were and all correct. Always these persistent fears. 
where I mean, people yeah. wanted to displace what's bad about their particular time period to the new shiny thing that, that people are doing, right? And so sure. you know, try and walk me through, you know, how different do you think the world will be today? Let's, let's make it very concrete. You know, what percentage of people wouldn't be getting the COVID vaccines in a pre-social media world? Because obviously a lot of misinformation about the pandemic in general and COVID vaccines is being shared on social media. But we also know that there's all kinds of conspiracy theories before the rise of social media. Right. So, you know, what's your prior? You know, how many yeah, know exactly. more or fewer people would be getting vaccinated yeah. uh, right now if all of social media didn't exist? And, 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 and why do you think there would be that difference? Roman? Um, so a lot of really, really great and very salient points you're making. And also, you know, there's sort of this link to like video games cause violence and et cetera, to kind of the new shiny thing. Um, Oh, what a great question about, you know, sort of how many people would be getting COVID vaccines. I mean, I, it, here's the thing that's always hard to figure out. And this is actually a result of algorithmic amplification and everything Siva was talking about. It is hard to understand sometimes how many people really do have these very extreme views and whether they are who they've always been, which is like some small degree of, you know, people, there have always been people who thought that, you know, there's some were being poisoned by the government and like this thing and that thing is happening. Now, have we allowed them a bigger platform than usual, right? You know, and in a, in a pre- Right, about, so, know, so John, for a second, about 10% yeah. of US population thought that the moon landing was fake in 1999. Mm -hmm. And on the polls that I trust, it's a hard thing to poll. I think about 10% of US population to any serious degree believe in some version of QAnon today, right? So- right. It, so is, is that like net, net of this, or is it just that there's always 10% of people who have pretty right and are, are, so, are right. they just more visible right so like are they just more visible now than we would have been otherwise because we would not have run, run into these people in our day-to-day -day. the part of the like maybe the complicated variable I want to bring into this is that to see this point about like reach and access and you know BBC and the CNN aren't able to reach as many people uh and we were all talking kind of about this like American narcissism and this like, idea of American exceptionalism but one you know one thing is we are also used to at least in the western world and general media being for us and about us and you know in a lot of developing countries um these are the channels by which people get information and share information so this actually is an interesting conversation to have like what what would the world look like without social media in bangladesh is a very different story than what it would look like you know in america because in bangladesh and like you know, my family's from bangladesh I used to go there a lot as a kid um you know you know, you still watch BBC and CNN and you watch the news happening in other parts of the world and then you kind of get like a little bit of local television and you don't get the in-depth sort of, you know, sharing and spreading of information, good and bad, frankly, uh, that you would otherwise. And sometimes that may mean you are not being exposed to government propaganda and other times that means, you know, someone's uncle has this like weird tinfoil hat theory that is now spread through your entire family and everyone's talking about it and therefore no one's getting a vaccine, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, one thing we might want to consider is I would argue that uh, without social media, the United States would be slightly different but Brazil would be significantly different. Mm -hmm. India mm -hmm. would be significantly different. Bangladesh would be significantly different. Myanmar would be very different. Uh, the Philippines would be different. Rodrigo Duterte would not be president of the Philippines without, without Facebook and WhatsApp. Uh, Narendra Modi would probably be prime minister of India, but he wouldn't have the mobs at his disposal to engage in, in storms of violence as he has. Now, those mobs existed when he was chief minister of Gujarat. They're just more easy to summon and they're more easy to deploy, especially through these services themselves, right? He's perfected this terrorism through threat, through and, these And by systems. the way, sorry, just to interject, not just locally, but globally. Right? Absolutely. Like I have been subject to <laughs> that too. sort of harassment, right? <laughs> exactly. like, here we are, halfway right. across the world, and these people yeah. can find us and harass us. But, in, but to, to the question of this 10% problem, right? Yeah, 10% of Americans might have doubted the moon landing was real in, what was it, 1999, you said, right? Um, it would be really interesting to see how many doubted it in 1969. Um, you know, whether that grew as people who actually witnessed it on TV uh, faded from view. But, but the other thing is, um, uh, you could say 10% of Americans believe in QAnon. What matters is not what they believe or the ex or the or the pervasiveness of the belief. What matters is the consequence. That ten percent of Americans believe the moon landing was fake. 
or even 50% of Americans believe the moon landing was fake. As far as I can tell, nobody stormed Cape Canaveral in Florida and tried to take it over and tried to kill people. But on January 6th, that happened the in point. the United States. So the consequences matter because Facebook is not just about spreading beliefs and, and, and subscribing people to beliefs or people subscribing to beliefs. Facebook is about action. Facebook is about motivation. And here's the thing about democracies. This, the bulwark to too much motivation is deliberation. Every democratic republic needs both motivation and deliberation, right? The hot and the cold. And at this so, point, we, we lack uh, serious deliberation. I, I have a question for you then, Billing. This is really fascinating. So this is kind of the idea of like different social media platforms and different me like ways of sharing media are very different. Do you think that somehow that Facebook is more of a tool of coordination than other platforms? Oh, and like when I say oh Facebook, no. actually like the Facebook ecosystem, right? So just, yeah, just yeah. to like bring in my thread earlier about WhatsApp, yeah. right? WhatsApp ended up limiting the number of shares, et cetera, because people were mobilizing. So like I, more of a question I have for you because I, I find this thread very fascinating. Yeah. Well, no doubt. So my colleague De David Neymar has been studying the role of WhatsApp in Brazil and mm -hmm. specifically WhatsApp groups and, and even more specifically Pro, Pro Bolsonaro WhatsApp groups. Now, WhatsApp does not is not subject to algorithmic amplification, right? It's subject purely to social amplification. It's not disconnected from Facebook, right? People find each other on Facebook and and invite people into WhatsApp groups, right? But uh, so there is coordination across those media as well. And everything that happens that Bolsonaro spreads and his supporters spread on 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 WhatsApp also works on Facebook. So these are not different systems completely. Nonetheless, what he's finding is this question of creating people creating these these um these groups that fire each other up that motivate each other that exclude that fire up fear and paranoia and then direct people to action and we're seeing this time and time again and it's a really fascinating phenomenon again we know this happens in india the same way right but but what's happening there is it's explicitly coordinated and organized by bolsonaro his son and and the the party right so uh so i think that that's that's something we really have to take into account quite clearly that there is there are there are, these tools are so effective at what they are designed to do and originally they were designed to make us connect with each other over our hobbies they've just been hijacked for other purposes I want to get back to to something that you both were saying sort of a few minutes ago. I'm glad that we're talking about many democracies outside of the United States um, that are struggling at the moment, a topic that's particularly dear to my heart. Um, uh, but both of you seem to say that in a way, social media has made less of a difference in the United States than perhaps it has in uh, India and Brazil and Bangladesh and other countries around the world. Um, that's a really interesting thought to me. I hadn't heard that before this conversation. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the reason for that would be. So I'd love to, for both of you to, to, sure. to, to talk me through this. Roman, what, why, uh, yeah, why uh, uh, if I'm understanding you right, do you think that it's made a bigger difference in, way, um, in, in countries outside of the United States than it has uh, domestically? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes back to the point I was making about there was a bit of an information vacuum, you know, in a lot of these smaller countries or sort of less noticed countries that are actually often not smaller countries from either a geographic or political sense, they're smaller from like a GDP and, you know, impact on global economy sense, right? Um, there was just not a lot of visibility. You couldn't get information. There wasn't a journalist being funded by CNN to do the Bangladesh beat, right? Yeah, there, there's, there was literally no such thing. So it, it it was, it's not so much that it's, it's made a bigger difference because there was a bigger vacuum and they sort of came in and sort of, and this is completely unintentionally swept in and consumed this vacuum. And like, and this is where the problems arise, right? And this is a mismatch of sort of incentives and incentive structures. You know, social media companies did not expand to, you know, a country, the global South with the intention of providing information and information vacuum. They just went because they wanted to get people to like share memes and talk about stuff, right? But then in, in optimizing for sharing memes and talking about stuff, it led to all these negative externalities around things that are actually quite critical for global development. And like, you know, insert plug here about why there needs to be more social scientists working at all of these companies and developing these <laughs> algorithms because right. any social scientist could have told you this is what was going to happen. Yep, yep. And I would add to that, I'll get a little wonky here, so forgive me, uh, uh, in sort of media policy wonky. Um, there's this concept called zero rating, 
So, you know, we all pay for data when we uh, pay our cell phone bills every month. I, I pay AT&T way too much money. Uh, you know, whatever company you use, you pay them a lot of money to have this unlimited flow of data. In the United States, it's generally unlimited and unmetered. That's not true in most countries. So imagine most of the world, let's talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, let's talk about parts of South America, uh, the poorer parts of Brazil, let's talk about um, most of South Asia uh, or Southeast Asia, in fact. Uh, and in those places, if you go back almost 10 years, you're just starting to see the introduction of mobile phone networks. And they are mostly urban phenomena and they're mostly among those who can afford to pay a standard monthly fee and can afford to pay for very expensive data services. Well, Mark Zuckerberg decided this was a problem, that there were gonna be 2 billion people on earth who might never get access to high speed streams of data. And he's actually pretty philanthropic, He's actually very, very socially minded in these matters, even though I think he's completely misguided and thoroughly uneducated. Um, but his naive vision was, oh, wouldn't the world be better if all of these farmers and all these workers and these women who are toiling, uh, carrying water on their heads for five miles would somehow have access to all this knowledge and all of this data and be able to communicate with each other and start small businesses. Wouldn't that be great? So he started this program called Free Basics. And what that meant was, he would cut deals with these telecommunication companies and the governments in many states. At this point, it's something like 40 countries. And he said, if you offer this suite of applications through your phones and, and people use this particular suite of applications, they just happen to be mostly Facebook applications. They're Facebook, they're Facebook Messenger, they're WhatsApp, they're Instagram, but there's also a Wikipedia app and there's usually a public health app and a, an app that takes you straight to uh, government services. This suite of apps, if people use those, they will not have to pay for data. It's zero rated, it's free. This was the only way that people were gonna get access to data streams and data communication and any sort of internet service. And this had a tremendous and almost immediate impact in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in Cambodia. It's, and and it, it has been tremendously successful from the point of view of Facebook, of bringing all these new people in. That's how they reach 3 billion people so quickly. The problem is for people living in this country, dependence set in almost immediately. Mm -hmm. How else can you keep up with your family? If you have a cousin who's serving on an ocean liner, like a Filipino family has one cousin mm -hmm. serving on an ocean liner and they need to be in touch with this person, the only cost-effective way they can be in touch with this person is through WhatsApp and through zero rating, right? So the dependence set in. So when we had a, a six hour outage of all Facebook services on Monday, that was actually quite dangerous to millions, maybe billions of people around the world who need these services as a lifeline. The dependence is that strong. And we're talking about a lot of countries that never had a good landline system and mm -hmm. had barely had a decent voice system for mobile mm -hmm. telephony, right? And so and so the, the, the dependence is serious and therefore living through the Facebook algorithm becomes that much more pervasive in many of these countries. Not coincidentally, you have dictatorial leaders like in Cambodia, like in Vietnam, like in Myanmar, who are exploiting these services quite effectively. Now let's remember, while the US is less affected, it's less affected because we have a diverse communication system. We have mm -hmm. options. We can live without Facebook. When Facebook went down, most people laughed, right? Well, most I didn't people... even, I, honestly, I, I found out through Twitter. <laughs> right, and it was and it was during the work day. And you know, so even school kids weren't on Instagram, let's hope, during the school day, right? They so it was were, no big deal in the okay. United States. Very few people were really hurt. In fact, the lower income you have, the more you were affected because lower income people yes. depend on Facebook to do things like coordinate childcare and transportation in ways that wealthier mm -hmm. people who have choices like that don't have to. So we have to look at, again, social scientists know this because we interview people who mm -hmm. use these services in different ways and their devices in different ways. And we track how it affects people in different countries and at different income levels. So there's no generality about this, but let's also recognize that while the US is affected far less than Brazil or India or Bangladesh, 
Germany and Sweden, where Facebook usage is actually less of a constant part of the day, are affected even less by mm -hmm. uh, these sorts of things. Whereas in Hungary and Poland, Facebook is incredibly important to daily life, right? So these coincidences should should not just remain pure coincidences. Uh, so one thing I, I want to actually like sort of raises a point that's worth discussion is like, you know, I don't want it to seem like we're sort of giving people a free pass. We're not giving social media companies a free pass to this. Right, right, right. And why this matters in like in my day-to-day -day job, right? When I think through algorithmic bias or like issues and negative externalities and bad things that happen, one of the most important things to think about is intent or sort of why it happened. And it is a very, very different approach to things like misinformation and disinformation, for example. When somebody is, for example, a bot farm that is a malicious actor that has been paid by a political party to right. amplify wrong information versus, you know, even if it's a, a CEO of a social media company or, you know, some well-meaning uncle or whatever who didn't realize or didn't think about it and they should have been better educated, absolutely. But the thing is, the approach for mitigation is actually quite different. So, you know, do we face it head on as an I'm fighting an enemy or do I face it in a sense that like, hey, you know, this, this person might actually be on this journey with us if there is better visibility and understanding of what these problems are, you know, and I think like today, if we're talking about Facebook, I think often that is what we are debating, right? It's like, did they know and not care or did they just not know, right? And I, I feel like people have like very solid and very developed opinions, but like the reason the answer to that question matters is that answers the question of what we should do about it. I'm glad that you brought up misinformation, disinformation, because I think that's uh, an important strand of a current public discourse that we haven't really touched on so far in our conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I worry about with those terms is that they're very, very broad and they describe, you know, all kinds of different things. As you're saying, it describes, uh, you know, the well-intentioned uncle that, you know, has fallen prey to some silly idea and is sort of spreading uh, uh, that stuff on, on Facebook or Twitter. It uh, sometimes refers simply to an idea or a theory that is considered by uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, people in, 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 in the political or the business elite uh, to be beyond the pale in some kind of way, uh, to be, you know, clearly erroneous, um, even for perhaps it's still an unsettled question. I think this happened, for example, with reference to the origins of a pandemic. Um, uh, and then it can be you know, a, a foreign government uh, deliberately employing uh, a bot army and other people in order to very deliberately spread some kind of false information, right? Um, what can we do about these different categories of things? My understanding is that when this is uh, a bot army, uh, there may be things we can do about it, because while I'm a sort of fervent believer in freedom of speech, it's not clear to me that I am a believer in the freedom of people to have, you know, 700 fake accounts speak for them. And I think you can make, you know, relatively clean distinctions there. I'm sure there's hard cases, it's not technologically straightforward, but, you know, conceptually, I think that distinction is relatively easy. Um, when it comes to the other things, it becomes much, much harder, right? Um, we decided uh, about a year and a half ago that the idea that uh, 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 the origin of a pandemic may be something like a lab leak uh, was beyond the pale. Um, people were deplatformed from uh, Facebook and YouTube, including Nobel Prizes in virology for uh, maintaining that that was one of the possible origins of a pandemic. And while we still don't know what the truth of, of the matter is, at this point, the highest circles of the American government, as well as many mainstream newspapers, are taking that seriously as one possible explanation for what happened, right? So one of the first big examples of a use of misinformation, disinformation discourse in order to say this is beyond the pale has turned out to be at the very least premature and perhaps an important mistake. And then when it comes to sort of saying, hey, you know, uh, Uncle Steve, you don't get to say this stuff because we think you're a little too stupid and what you're saying there is sort of incoherent, um, that's sort of problematic in a different way still. So, so how do you think about, you know, what we should do about misinformation, disinformation, what we can do without it really uh, restricting freedom of speech or putting us in danger of actually uh, cutting off important debates uh, in a way that's itself quite harmful. Um, Roman, why don't we start with you and then go to Silla. 
I'm I might actually defer to Siva to start to like start the ball rolling on this question because uh, yeah, I think I may defer to you. I, I know you've been working on this for years. There, yeah, I mean, there was a lot in in that uh, question. Yes, I, I would say um, sort of working backwards from that. The question of beyond the pale. That notion of what was beyond the pale was for a long time regulated by a rather narrow set of of uh, of elites in uh, just about every society, including every democracy, right? So what was beyond the pale in let's pick on 1999 uh, was determined by those who decided what got on the nightly news, what got expressed in the editorial pages of major newspapers. There was a set of group, a certain amount of group think that way because people who worked for those institutions tended to have all come from the same social class, often the same race, mostly mm -hmm. the same gender. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we struggled uh, for m most of the 20th century was to diversify the set of voices who got to be gatekeepers, who got to decide what was beyond the pale or where the pale would sit, right? Where would we put the pale? And, and that is a fascinating discussion. If you look at all of these debates, not just about censorship, because censorship is very much about governmental action, but about what would be a, um, a legitimate concern for public deliberation and debate, that's never been easily settled, but it's often been a reflection of who gets to choose and who is in power. Mm -hmm. Now we have an environment in which lots of people can say lots of things in lots of formats, where we have too much noise, too much expression, and very little ability to filter sense from nonsense. That said, we have two aspects that reflect power or amplify power. One is we still have uh, certain maldistributions of social power in society. So Yasha, you get to write for The Atlantic, I get to write for uh, Wired and, and The Guardian. We are powerful relative to our cousins who don't get that option, right? So that's important. Um, uh, we also, all three of us have the power to speak through this channel, which is pretty powerful. It's sanctioned by the great University of North Carolina, right? Tremendous amount of cultural power. We get to say a tremendous amount and we get to choose what we say. And there's very little anyone can do to stop us. And if we were deplatformed de from the University of North Carolina, there are a thousand other places that we could be heard because we have followings, we have status, we have degrees, et cetera, right? So that's important to remember too. But we're now in the 21st century living in a, in a moment when everybody gets to say something, but not everybody gets to reach the same audience. So our, my concern is that we still have quiet portions of society, people who are not being heard or not finding audiences and not having, not having an ability to be listened to, largely because they are making sense, largely because they're saying things that are well thought out, well researched, calmly uh, uh, calmly expressed and there is no market for the calm there is no market for the thoughtful now it's not that there's no market it's just harder to reach because the structure of our systems is favors the extreme favors the angry favors the radical favors the the, the divisive and that's ultimately unhealthy i think it's a much bigger question than the notion of deplatforming, right? Um, you know, you can undeplatform people all the time if you've found you made a mistake. I don't think that's really a crucial problem in society. Well, but th there's an interesting concept like to deplatforming, right? And you know, Twitter has a whole team that works on this concept of healthy conversations and what does it mean to have like good public discourse, things that are like immensely unmeasurable, you know, good luck, like try to catch light in the glass, right? Um, but what's fascinating and something I'm thinking about a lot lately is like, what is the purpose of the platforming, right? So, you know, we have all of these tools and we can mute things and mute people. And maybe see this goes back to like the very first thing you said about, you know, we all optimize for individual pleasure and consumption, but then sort of net, it is a harmful thing. Or, you know, maybe put it another way, we all have the ability to mute Donald Trump. Why did Twitter then still have to take him off the platform? You know, very easy, go on, you know, mute type the words out, you never have to see it again. But then what is this sort of collective negative externality that requires 
deplatforming or makes makes you know these things better or some may say worse if an individual is deplatformed. I do agree with you; it can be reversed, etc. Um, but it's very it's very interesting to think through. And again, like not to bring everything back to measurement, but I've been thinking a lot about some systems level bias. So in my world, people talk a lot about algorithmic auditing. I had a company in algorithmic auditing, and like my biggest like bang bang my head against the wall problem is that like we treat these algorithms like they exist in a bubble, like they don't exist by human interaction. Even your conversation you were saying about like, you know, political leaders weaponizing these things. What's fascinating from like an inside perspective as somebody who, you know, may influence or be part of creating algorithms to do things, you know, an algorithm does not distinguish Bolsonaro from an average Brazilian citizen, but like obviously in the real world, this individual carries a lot more weight, clout, power, et cetera, that is organic to existing in the real world and not a function of an algorithm. So like the biggest problem to tackle here is the systems level by, and like to like go overly academic for a minute, it is systems level bias that is a function of the socio-technical interaction between users and an algorithm. And that is frankly where like the most the most interesting part of my job lies, yeah. but like it's interesting because it is the most difficult to solve or resolve or even address. Cool. So, so I, have, I have a specific <laughs> question about that uh, for you, Roman, but but comes out of an earlier strand of a conversation. And after that, I want to bring in some of the great questions that we're, that we're getting from the audience. Um, so, you know, you're sitting at Twitter and you're trying to think, how can we tweet the algorithm um, in, in such a way potentially to improve the systems level attributes of the discourse, to make it better and more public spirited and so on. Um, we said earlier that in a context like Brazil, one of the problems you have is WhatsApp um, and the way that people can gather in WhatsApp in groups and mobilize uh, to, to, to attack political opponents or uh, you know, to propagate propaganda for you know, a, 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 an authoritarian leader. But WhatsApp doesn't really have an algorithm, right? It is just the ability to send particular people messages or form a group and send messages to that group. And yet it, it appears that many of the toxic attributes mm -hmm. that you see on Twitter and that you see on Facebook are just as strong on something like WhatsApp. But if that's the case, then isn't any tweak to an algorithm going to be like a drop of water in the bucket? Is, isn't it going to be far too small to have the desired impact? If even something that doesn't do the, you know, uh, attention grabbing, whatever engages most is gonna be at the top of the news feed, uh, et cetera stuff. If something that doesn't have those features still um, can end up being toxic if a political context is toxic in that way. Then, then what can any changes to the algorithm possibly hope to achieve? That's a great question. To kind of think about it another way, maybe changing algorithms or banning algorithms or whatever is not actually a holistic solve in and of itself, right? There are many things that need to happen. Among them, and maybe to give a more dissatisfactory answer, part of this may be actually just battling against human nature, right? So it's kind of, you know, we to like bring it to like a dietary perspective. We evolved, you know, as, as a species to really love the way salty, fatty, sweet foods taste. I know that I can't eat pizza for every meal, but man, don't I wish I could, right? But I have to wake up and like have my protein shake in the morning and have broccoli at lunch to see this point, right? So we know we have to do these things. So like, yes, to, but, but maybe an ice cream truck shouldn't come by my house every day, you know? So there is an aspect to it that like, you know, Algorithms may be tempting people, like dangling candy in front of you in, in a way that's, you know, the things you are seeing when you open your social media as a function of an algorithm, which is a function of sort of optimizing for possibly some of the worst aspects of ourselves that we have to battle against. Uh, and now this is not to like sort of adopt this whole like algorithms are evil and manipulative and algorithms are big tobacco. I think that's, an, that's kind of a facile argument because the thing it ignores is, you know, the human ability to actually make decisions and like some of the decisions we make are not easy, but we do things in our everyday lives that are, you know, long term good for ourselves, even if they're like short term uncomfortable like exercising. But to your point of like, you know, part of this is sort of how people may end up misusing these platforms and like we never really got to like talk about like misinformation disinformation and the thing I want to like distinguish here and this is all about going back to this idea of intent right. 
There's also like, what is the nature of this misinformation or disinformation? And one of the unfortunate things is like everything has gotten mashed together, like mis slash disinformation. They are two actually very, very distinct things. You know, one of them is sort of over lies. And the other one, which I find the most fascinating is more of a like bait and switch. We're gonna make you look over here. So you're not doing what's, you're not looking at what's happening over there. Why is that important? Because the thing happening over here, like, and I'm gonna quote like, but her emails, right? The thing happening over here is not actually the most critical thing. It is truthful. That that thing X is happening. I am just going to make you look over here like a magician so that when I like do my thing over here, you're not noticing that. And those are like, and again, because what I always think in my head is like, how do you stop these things? How do you address these things? Two totally different ways of thinking and addressing these concepts. I mean, when I, I think I about this, to, I, uh, sorry, so I, I want to start bringing some, yeah. some questions in from, from the audience because we have a lot of great ones. And just to remind you, you can add ones. Uh, by submitting them to the Q&A uh, Q function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we have a great question from Daklin who asks, um, if social media companies are owned by individuals that are largely interested in maximizing profit, how much trust can we have that these companies will limit the profits for the sake of honest and well-intended social debate? Um, and I think one of the sort of paradoxes that this speaks to is that, um, you know, on things like deplatforming, or even on things on how to regulate and change algorithms, on one side, we could leave that decision up to, you know, a few people in Silicon Valley, like Mark Zuckerberg and your boss, Roman. Um, and we would have to trust that they're actually public spirited when they have a very clear uh, market interest to follow. And frankly, probably some of them, if they didn't follow those market interests, the boards mm -hmm. would eventually substitute them with somebody who does. So they're also under constraints, right? Yeah, yeah. But then on the other hand, uh, the alternative is, well, let, let the government decide. But given the state of democracy around the world, given the existence of uh, a scary authoritarian leaders uh, like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil or AMLO in Mexico or Narendra Modi in India, or some of the uh, recent and perhaps future presidents we have here in the United States, um, you know, there's very real reason why you don't want politicians to get too involved in, in this stuff either. Yeah. So um, sure. how do we, you know, square this circle? Well, there are more than two hands. Uh, there's not just on the one hand or the on the other hand. So let me give you a sense. Um, uh, so first of all, to the premise, uh, Facebook is owned by shareholders, but there's a very strange and rather unhealthy form of corporate governance at Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg will in perpetuity and his heirs after that have majority control of the voting shares of the stock. And that's never going to change. It's part of the charter, part of the IPO documents. It's not good. This was a system that was created for and by Google and its founders, and it's found its way into other companies that were far less successful or moral, companies like Uber, companies like uh, WeWork. It's a terrible idea. So in fact, no one can fire Mark Zuckerberg. He is chairman and CEO for life until he decides he doesn't want to be, right? Doesn't seem like he's getting bored with his job. So what about that? What do we know about Mark Zuckerberg and his motivations? It turns out he's not motivated by money. And there's a reason for that. He's never done, gone without money. Imagine having so much money that you don't have to care about money. That's how much money Mark Zuckerberg has and how much money Facebook has. Now, believe me, there are richer people than Mark Zuckerberg who still care very much about money, right? Bezos being one of them, right? So it's not that everybody at that level of wealth has a different ideological motivation, but Mark Zuckerberg is a very special person. He is unlike any other corporate leader I have ever looked at. He is motivated by idealism. It's just not healthy, complex, nuanced, historically informed, sociologically sophisticated uh, uh, altruism. It's a, the kind of altruism that is, that is um, uh, techno-fundamentalist, right? He believes firmly that if you wire people together and you structure their conversations and their social relations from above, like a, like a puppeteer, then people will start living better, behaving better, trusting each other more, liking each other more. This is why he redesigned Facebook a few years ago to push us into groups. This is why he redesigned Facebook a few years ago to minimize the, the uh, amplification of legitimate news services, including Yasha, your articles, right? They, become, they got less play on Facebook since 2018. And what he has turned up the volume on, and this again, very well documented 
very much declared by Facebook was posts from our cousins, our uncles, our neighbors, right? So less Yasha Monk and more crazy uncle. And that has not been healthy, but it's because Mark Zuckerberg truly believes that if we are in contact with people who uh, we care about and occasionally in contact with people we might not know, we're gonna get to trust each other more, like each other more, live better, food will taste better, cats and dogs will get along better, we'll sing Kumbaya. This is his motivation. He truly believes that the more we use Facebook, the better we will be. The more reasons we use Facebook, the better we will be. The more time we spend with Facebook, the better we will be. And nothing has shaken him from that belief. All the bad PR in the world to him just seems like bad PR and misunderstanding of his ideological function. That's why he spends so many billions of dollars every year trying to get Facebook into the hands of people in the poorest countries in the world from whom he will make no money probably ever. So that's what, I mean, like that just sort of echoes the sort of Silicon Valley techno solutionism and the ego around it. I mean, we see Andreessen Horowitz sort of creating their own media outlet now that, you know, tech bros are no longer the, the darlings of media. So the answer has not been, oh, maybe we should like rethink our impact on society if we are hearing from, you know, the general public that like, no, no, the answer actually is we're just going to go make our own because we don't like what you're saying, right? So it's sort of like a global you know, sort of problem. Or we'll create a society on the sea, right? We'll sea yeah, stand and create you, you, you a, a libertarian on society on you, the you sea. Mean on or, Mars? Yeah. yeah like, well, I mean, like, well, why do you think we're trying to go to space, right? Like, right. it's not for you and me. We're never going to space. We're never calling Like, you and me will never be on a Mars colony, right? We may yeah. be like serving food on a Mars colony. <laughs> will exactly. never actually legitimately be there. Uh, but no, but, but I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I, I think there is this, you know, techno libertarianism. Um, and I'm going to try to remember the name of this really wonderful and very interesting article from, I think, dates back from the 90s. And I really cannot remember it. But it, it is actually about this phenomenon, this idea of like how this idealism of tech kind of gets warped into, you know, what if, you know, what if human beings are the problem and then technology will sort of be the solution? So the problem is, Yasha and Siva, you exist and write articles, but actually the solution is this sort of, you know, a humble everyday man type of thing, which actually isn't, you know, maybe not the problem. And then the, the issue with pointing out that problem yeah. is it sounds like you are this like pro-government, pro, you know, institutionalist individual who doesn't want the average man to like have their say in the world. So like it, it's, it, it's a, it is a very, Un, un, unintentionally devious and intelligent yeah. uh, argument to make, right? Yep. And this is where, you know, if, if we're going to like have this bigger picture, Yash, I know you've sort of referenced COVID a few times, this like this anti-intellectualism, right? And this is like, this is not just about doctors and people making COVID vaccines and people who are actually educated and like epidemiologists. This is about attacking university professors. This is about attacking, you know, educational institutions in general, under this guise of like the everyday person must be elevated, and you know, it, you know, my, my the thing is for those of us who've been doing American politics for a very long time, yeah, I think all of us had that moment when we just stopped talking to people on social media about elections because, man, it's like you know, it, you know, forget my literal PhD in American politics and the fact that I studied state and local politics and like, or just, oh, to tell me more about what you googled and like, right. you know, just talk at me about how your opinions are the same as my degree. But again, you can't say that because then you are the elite. Um, I have another question from Noah, which is uh, in light of recent information from a whistleblower about Facebook, should lawmakers consider restrictions to social media sites? And I'm gonna broaden the question a little bit to ask you, what kind of laws or regulations would actually yeah. help to solve some of the problems we've been talking about? Yeah, so, so speaking of armchair speculation, right? <laughs> Sorry, Stephen, go no, ahead. But I just had to get my like dig in right there. Yeah. Well, okay, so a couple of things. Around the world, content on social media is highly regulated. You may not criticize Islam in Pakistan. You may not criticize Ataturk in Turkey using Facebook, right? End of story. Like there are many countries around the world with significant legal restrictions on content on social media and other media forms. That's not us, nor should it be, right? And in fact, because of our constitution, we won't have the kind of restrictions that seem to address 
what I call the weather rather than the climate, right? Which is the bad stuff that bothers us flowing on social media. Uh, it's bad, like the weather can be bad, but it's ultimately not the problem. And because it's not the problem, let's think about what might work. And most of the proposals for addressing the, the problems of Facebook address either the problems of Facebook from a purely American point of view, or from a purely American legal point of view, or imagine that Facebook is this tiny little website that exists only in the United States and people only publish in English, uh, or they're looking back to 20th century precedents and imagine that this company resembles in any way Standard Oil or AT&T. And it's one of the reasons I think antitrust is basically a dead end for this kind of address. There's something different about Facebook and Google and Twitter and by the way, Walmart and AT&T and Verizon and CVS. And that is, these are all data companies. These are all companies that monitor everything they can about us, our, 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 our locations, our movements, our, our social relations and our social networks, our expressions, our shopping habits, our, uh, our relative wealth, all of these things feed into this predictive systems that then feed back to us often products we want. That's good. I, I'm a dog person. I'd rather see dog ads and cat ads. Great. That's a slight convenience. However, it has a tremendous number of effects by structuring us, by guiding us, by having tremendous control over what we see and what we ultimately think and with whom we interact and ultimately the prices we pay for things. There are all sorts of ways that this data surveillance is bad. And if we really wanna take the problem of Facebook seriously, we need to strike at the, at the, at the, the very thing that the beast eats and the beast eats data. We need strong data protection in this country and in most countries, stronger than the general data protection regulation in Europe right now, which is a nice start and a good outline of principles, but in practice is falling way too short. We should have real serious limitations on how long these companies can control data and for what they can use it. This would not be a First Amendment problem. It doesn't restrict anyone from saying anything. It doesn't restrict any company from promoting anything. It merely weakens the engine the algorithmic engine, the predictive engine, the artificial intelligence engine, uh, and probably spread some of that power to other parts of society, mm -hmm. specifically returning power to people. So I will uh, publicly thoughts. accuse oh. you, Siva, of uh, spreading misinformation about being a dog person until you show us uh, live any dog. Oh, Siva so has adorable, <laughs> adorable dogs. <laughs> Thank you. Butter is very cute. <laughs> well, in um, that case, you have to show them to us. But uh, Ruman, what, 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 yes. so, what do you so think two things, help? Right. So like whenever I think about regulation, you know, and maybe this is sort of the disaster planning individual in me, I always like to think of what is the worst that someone could do who was someone I did not like in power, right? right? So as we think about what we want in terms of regulation, what would that regulation mean in the hands of a political actor who was somebody I despise and whoever that may be, right? So like we need to be very, very careful when we think about how, the, and this is why, you know, most legal people are like, are very careful individuals because frankly, that's how they think. They think of what are all the ways this can be misused in the ways that we did not intend, right? So we may think that, you know, banning algorithms is a great idea like no social media company should use algorithms. Like, great, okay, well, how might that be misused if there was somebody in power who wanted to consolidate power or control information? You know, how might they expand that, that regulation? That's kind of one way uh, I think about this. And, you know, kind of cutting to the heart of data and back to this, like, maybe there's a world in between one complete black box ownership of data by companies and two, you know, I've been thinking a lot actually about GDPR and, you know, the two things it did introduce that is, you know, has been positive, but frankly, is a bit of a blunt instrument is the right to not be found and the right to own your data, right? So, you know, the answer kind of lies in this in-between world of like, I don't want to not be found. I just want to be found on my own terms. And that's actually a very different thing and requires a lot more work by both government as well as companies uh and you know from like an infrastructure perspective and a lot of companies like that's a really really hard thing to do um and, and it's been interesting sort of in my own job like thinking through that and the idea of like user agency so one thing that we've been tackling on my team with dr sarah roberts who's been a scholar in residence uh she's co-director of the the ucla center for uh oh gosh <laughs> center for critical internet inquiry Ooh. uh 
you know, so we've been tackling this idea of like algorithmic choice and user agency and this, you know, the way user agency has usually been sort of constructed is it's a series of like toggles and I can turn things on and off. It doesn't actually fundamentally change whether or not the company has this data and what they might be doing with this data. And it certainly does not change whether or not, you know, bad things exist. It just allows me to kind of gentrify my neighborhood, right? So to give like a very San Francisco analogy to it, there is massive homelessness in San Francisco. All the hyper wealthy tech people do is go live in the neighborhoods where they can pay for people to shove out the homeless people. That does not actually solve homelessness. It just puts them in other places where we don't have to look at it. And that has largely been the approach on social media or just you know in general about like user agency or ownership. It's not solving problems. It's like sort of making sure I don't have to look at it. But like, what does it mean to have meaningful ownership over data? And you're right, Steve, it's actually not a solved problem at all. Um, I have a slightly different uh, uh, question that, that sort of opens a different strand of conversation, but is really interesting from John. Uh, if you could design a curriculum for children growing up today, uh -huh. so that they would know how to use these tools effectively, uh, what would you want them to learn? Oh, that, can, can I can I hop in? Yeah, this? Because this is literally my yeah. origin story. This is my origin story. <laughs> this is how I got into out like 100% this is my origin story. So are you trying to tell uh, us you're a super villain? I mean, that's usually who has an origin well, story. Wait, why did you go straight to villain? Why can't you <laughs> that's, that's the context in which I think of origin stories. <laughs> have origin stories too. I like to think of myself. Oh, that's true. Sorry, hero. you're a super. That's, that makes sense. Right. He's an Avenger. Doesn't every villain like to think of themselves as a, as a hero? So um, back when I was in my PhD program, I, you know, because we are all broke and we are grad students, I was teaching a course at a local community college, Grossmont Community College. I absolutely loved it. And I love teaching at community college because the students there, you know, are all like incredibly intellectually curious and like rarely get access to like, you know, like, the kind of information uh, you know, that they, that they want to learn from. They get a lot of amazing, amazing students. And I had a student tell me that she doesn't believe in climate change. And I did not know how to answer her uh, because that, that statement did not make sense to me, right? Like, it is not like, for me, like how I was raised and the institutions I went to and how I was educated, there's no such thing as believing or not believing in science. It's science, it's a thing. Like, and, and I didn't know how to answer her. And as a teacher, I said, well, you know, you could not believe the sun is going to come up tomorrow, but it's still going to come up. Like I, did, I didn't understand her. I literally could not comprehend the statement. So this is actually the same year uh, uh, Eli Pariser's book on the filter bubble came out. And that, that was the book I read. And that's what really got me into like, oh my gosh, like all these things exist. Uh, and you know, it sort of can lead to people misunderstanding things or not understanding things. And what I realized about a lot of my students, and I started to introduce this in curriculum is that, you know, it is assumed that because younger people are digital natives, they just automatically know how to parse through good and bad information. Oh, they're better than us at using technology. It's actually not true. And I specifically remember as a child being brought to a library and being taught to do primary and secondary information. I remember having these like worksheets where you have to find primary information sources and things like that. And I actually started to introduce that into my, this is like an intro to American politics class, right? I started to introduce, I used to started to teach literally college children, like college adults, to things that they were not taught as children, because there was an assumption that they kind of knew how to parse through good and bad information. I found that largely they could not. Um, and, a, and, and the thing that's kind of misleading about the internet is like, you know, anybody is a superstar, right? Like, there's no reason anyone should necessarily listen to me over the, over lots of other people about certain topics, yet, you know, somebody might. And sort of, you know, dovetailing with this era of influencers, with this era of sort of, you know, um, talking heads and spokespeople, you know, a, a reasonably well-designed substack, you know, is not necessarily objective media, but it is very, very hard to discern the two. And we do ourselves a disservice when we assume younger people understand how to do that, when frankly, I think it is more confused than it has ever been before. So that's one thing I actually started doing in my classes back in uh, 2011, was literally teach students how to discern primary and secondary sources of information, you know, and like every professor will jokingly, will say jokingly, like, no, you're not allowed to cite, cite Wikipedia in your paper, right? So like all of these things, like there's a lot of education for even digital natives on how to parse through good and bad information that, that we need to impart. So I would add to that that I'm, my answer will be both orthodox and heterodox. Um, 
the orthodox part is what should such a curriculum look like to maintain uh, a, a widespread uh, proper sense of critical sensibility and uh, and facility. Uh, it should have a lot of math and a lot of science, uh, specifically statistics, which I think we have astounding illiteracy about statistics, probability, et cetera. I mean, right down to why you would get a vaccine, right? Uh, or not. A lot of it comes from this inability to understand relative risk, you know? Um, so there's that. So that's old school, right? That's orthodox stuff, chemistry, biology, physics, statistics, uh, you know, more of that, better that. Now, but here's the heterodox part. I don't think education is the way to think through this for several reasons. One, right now the problem in the world is not 15 year olds. The problem is 50 year olds. It's the 50 year olds who are screwing up the world. I'm, I have a father of a 15 year old. She is not hurting anybody. She's doing just fine. Uh, and she's actually quite good at discerning these things because she's fully engaged in her world. She just happens to be lucky enough to go to a good school, which most Americans are not. Right. So let's do better across the board with education in general and bring better classes and better paid teachers across the board. And we have a lot less to worry about. Now, that said, it's too late for the 50 year olds. But the thing about education is we often put uh, our solutions to our social problems our complex social and historical problems on teachers and students when they didn't cause the problem. They are the victims. Right. If someone is getting through school without a full vision of how statistics and probability work, how science is really supposed to work, they are the victims. They're not the problem to be solved. Right. The problem to be solved is that maldistribution of educational opportunity in, in this country and in the world. Let's also remember that this is a global problem. It's a global problem, again, concentrated among older people who actually have power to do things and hurt people in the world, not younger people. So I think it's a mistake to start thinking about curriculum first. That said, if we're going to think about curriculum, it's got to be about math and science. It also should be about history. It also should be about poetry. It should be about humanity. It should be about how we got to think how we are, how we got to know each other and understand one basic thing. So many questions about this incident that Ramon brought up. I believe or I don't believe those are expressions of identity. Those aren't expressions of thought or logic. This is a way of saying, this is my team, my tribe, my people. We don't adhere to this. We don't subscribe to this. It's not my kind of thing. Once you see it like that, it's a lot easier to unpack the influences and maybe reach a point where you can say, well, maybe that's a perspective question rather than a matter of facts and evidence. Oh, yeah, Sorry, yeah, I'm on mute. Uh, we have a great question from uh, Melissa, uh, which I, I, I really couldn't improve on. It, it sort of captures a lot of the things we've been thinking through, uh, which is, in your opinion, does social media facilitate aggressive polarization in politics, hmm. or does polarization make social media aggressive? <laughs> May Although, I jump right in this? <laughs> So earlier in the conversation, Roman brought up a phrase in the middle of one of her uh, really brilliant rants. And the phrase is so important. And that was socio-technical systems. We're talking about socio-technical systems. To ask, is it this or that, is the wrong question. Because every technology is embedded within networks of social relations. And every technology reflects back the power that had been in that has been built into those technologies. So there is no way of distinguishing between whether the system caused people to behave a certain way or think a certain way, or the people caused the system to reflect this. Both are true because there's constant feedback and conversation over time. The dynamism is something we really have to pay attention to. Again, we, we're in the habit of isolating variables. That's how we do chemistry experiments. It's not how we should think about humans mm -hmm. and their technologies, because every technology is an expression of cultural value and every technology reflects back upon cultural value and reflects back on beliefs and activities. I would also point out that polarization in and of itself is not a bad thing, right? Having people 
disagree vehemently about the world is actually healthy. <laughs> it's so much better than false consensus that ultimately limits imagination, right? If we have people with a wide range of views and in fact clusters on the extremes, that's not necessarily bad as long as we have forums and norms and habits and mutual respect that allows for at least a mutual recognition of the problems to be solved, followed by deliberation about how we might address those problems. Mm -hmm. So if the country and the world are polarized, that's not a bad thing. That's actually how we make progress. Well, and maybe to put a slightly academic slant on it, academic research about increasing political polarization predates the existence of modern social media. So like the earliest papers about like, hey, as a society, we are maybe getting more uh, polarized, et cetera, like for the deltas increasing kind of dates back to, I would say probably the 90s if I remember grad school properly. Um, so it kind of predates, but to see this point, like there is no original position, right? Yeah. There, there is no pre whatever. There was no world in which we sort of existed as like naive babies and then social media was introduced. Like, wouldn't that be a lovely experiment to have? So it is a difficult question to answer. So like the answer is yes and yes, right? So people came in and their expectation implicit or explicit of utilizing this tool would be to find like-minded individuals, to find their tribe, to find, you know, their, you know, their, their, their clan of people or the like-minded individuals it is subconsciously what they are attracted to. If we think about sort of the new world of like influencers, it is actively what they cultivate themselves for. I find it really interesting that the social media platform we have not talked about if we're talking about your generation is TikTok. Because TikTok to me is very, very fascinating because it's like, you know, it, it, there is sort of this evolution of even how we work on social media that has changed over time, where we were sort of more just ourselves, you know, sort of uh, a verbal diarrhea on social media when it came to like Friendster and like all the early days. And even on Facebook, we were sort of our whole selves. Twitter is kind of when people started to create personas, not on purpose, but just sort of you realize that you could find the people like you if you had a persona. TikTok is almost solely about creating a persona. You are on TikTok as like the lady with the cute farm and sheep who like sing songs to her sheep, right? Like you, you go in with the intent of I am a particular persona, right? And this is how we see like, you know, people who are the most successful uh, on these platforms, you know, I like solely thinking of Lil Nas X right now, are people who are really smart at manipulating that and sort of wrapping it around the persona they're trying to build about themselves. So like to the question of like, is X influencing Y or did Y influence X? It's a bit of both. We have also changed how we interact on social media as it you know, pertains to polarization because of how we act differently on social media today versus social yes. media 20 years ago. Yes, yes. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, I do wonder how social TikTok is, but that's for another time. <laughs> is it social media? Um, yeah. A very brief note to the audience, you should have had a little questionnaire pop up uh, in the background, uh, it's uh, voluntary, but would be very helpful uh, for you to fill out. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to ask uh, Roman and Siva a last question, which is that, you know, we were talking during the conversation and before about, you know, how quickly the change has taken place of social media, how radical that is. Um, but we haven't talked very much about the adaptation of particular individuals to that, right? In past times, when new technologies came on the horizon, eventually one of the social responses to it was that people figured out how to engage with it, how not to engage with it. Um, we figured out collectively rules of engagement, but also individually how we wanted to make sort of use of them. And, and, and I wonder whether one of the pieces of hope we might have is that those platforms that are the most toxic, that are the most political actually, that are the most uh, uh, controversial, are going to start turning people off, where the people will eventually say, you know what, um, I don't wanna be in an environment that's completely toxic. Perhaps I'll go on TikTok where everybody has the cute singing to sheep on the farm persona and I don't have to worry about this other stuff. So um, you know, if things look better in 10 or 20 years, you know, is that because of choice of individuals? Is that because of government regulation? Is that because Mark Zuckerberg uh, changes his idea of what to do? Sort of what would the positive path be? And we have two minutes. So uh, uh, Siva, one minute, I'm gonna look at my 60 second clock and then we'll get Roman to close it out. 
Okay, I mean, I would only say that there is no reason to think that Facebook is turning people off despite all of its problems and toxicity at the macro level. Because again, at the micro level, it's still not only important and valuable to most of the 3 billion users, but to many of them, it's crucial and they can't live without it. So if you are in Brazil, if you are in India, if you are in Bangladesh, chances are living without Facebook is not viable right now. Roman. Uh, I think it would be a combination of all of the above. I don't have a ton of faith that you know people uh, or organizations that are not incentivized to change their behavior because as Siva mentioned, they are incentivized to have other behavior will sort of magically grow a conscience, nor should we expect that, right? And so this is a cynic in me that you know people are driven by incentives. I do think that as individuals, we can and should be granted more agency and ability to control the world around us. So I do not think the world, you know, the decision should lie in a few people with a significant amount of power. Yep. Well, thank you so much uh, to the U UNC program for public discourse for hosting this wonderful conversation. Thank you to the many attendees and the great questions you asked. Uh, but most of all, of course, thank you to Ruman and Siva uh, for, for really a wonderfully engaged and insightful uh, conversation. Um, yeah. I hope we'll see you soon at one of the programs again. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.